Your Dog's Friend is a nonprofit 501c3 whose mission is to help keep dogs out of shelters by educating and supporting their humans. We promote positive method of training and behavior modification through stress-free methods. As part of that mission, we offer free webinars like the one you're about to watch. Subjects range from dog behavior, stress-free training, and other tools to help you understand your relationship with your dog. If you like the webinar, be sure to give us a thumbs up. Click the notification bell and subscribe to our channel. By subscribing, you'll be notified when future videos are posted. Now enjoy the webinar. Hello everyone. Welcome to today's webinar by your dog's friend on how to build your dog's focus and attention for the real world. We are lucky to have as our speaker, Lisa Lyle Wagner. Uh, Lisa is a certified professional dog trainer, knowledge assessed, a certified separation anxiety trainer, and a Pat Miller certified trainer level two. She is the founder of Cold Nose College in Murphy, North Carolina, on the faculty at the Victoria, Victoria Stillwell Academy for Dog Training and Behavior, and she is the author of the book, The Original Rocket Recall, Teach Your Dog to Come. I want to remind all of you to put your questions in chat. We will get to some of them part way through. The rest of them will probably come at the end, but we'll get to as many as possible. Some of you also may not realize that your dog's friend is a nonprofit and that our free services, including these webinars, rely on donations. So please consider donating. Go to the home page on our website and you'll see a donations icon in the upper right corner. We appreciate any amount that you feel capable of donating. I know that we will all learn a lot today. I'm excited about this webinar. It's all yours, Lisa. Thank you so much, Deborah. I really appreciate it. I've been a fan of your dog's friend for a long time, and there's so many wonderful learning opportunities that they offer um, for pet parents and trainers. I see some names I recognize here. Some are trainers, some are pet parents. Uh, so I look forward to spending time with you today. Before we get started, um, just want to let you know, I'm not going to be watching the chat myself. It's hard for me to watch the chat, keep my train of thought and keep things moving. But your dog's friend, the team, um, Carrie and Deborah, are going to be um, watching the chat. So if any, anything that I have to, to be asked immediately, I will. I'm going to be taking a break about a third of the way through my presentation, give a chance for questions, and then at the end of the presentation. But before we get started, type in the chat, and I will pull up the chat real quickly. Where is everybody from today? Where are you logging in from? Here, abroad, where? England, good some North Carolinians and South Carolinians. Hey, Trish. Hey, Stacy. Hey, Dale. She's in my in my state. Dale's opposite end of my state, 500 miles away. Look at all you guys. It, Carrie said it was 16 degrees there. It's about 45 and raining here. Winter Garden, Florida. Colleen, you've got some nice warmer weather. Coming. Hey, Kathleen. Coming, Georgia. Awesome. Lovely. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm going to share my screen now and pull my presentation up. So bear with me. And we'll get started. All right. There we go. Thank you again, uh, your dog's friend, for inviting me to talk about my dog won't listen. Today is filled with um, how to teach focus and attention what I call for both ends of the leaf, teaching you to focus on your dog and teaching your dog to focus on you. So thank you, everyone. I already did the poll. I wanna welcome you, but I also wanna welcome the animals beside you. Something tells me you all might have some furry friends nearby or feathered friends um, keeping you company. My boy, who some of you may know from seeing him online on Facebook, on the Coldness College page or my personal page, 
he's at day camp today because I didn't want him trying to jump in my lap and French kiss me while I was doing this presentation. So this, this focus and attention desire for me stemmed from wanting my own dog to focus on me. But really, I created this presentation and Brad and I have been teaching focus and attention like this for a lot of years. And it's because of the questions that are asked by our clients over and over and over again. The top two questions, how do I get my dog to listen to me? And how do I get my dog to come when called? Top two questions. The third question would be, how do I get my dog to stop jumping on me? But we're going to be talking about uh, focus and attention today. If you think about, I want my dog to listen to me, what does listen mean? The Oxford Dictionary defines it as to pay attention to someone or something you can hear. I like my dog to pay attention to me and I do want him to hear me, but I want him to hear me when I speak to him in a kind voice, not a nasty tone of voice and focus the center of interest or activity. I have to admit, I like being the center of interest for my dogs and I like to do active things with them. So I like that definition of both listen and focus. And then attention. I loved this when I looked it up. Notice taken of someone or something. The regarding of someone or something is interesting or important. Boy, I wanna be the most important thing in my dog's world, especially when I'm out and about with, with him. And you may hear me say her. Um, many of you may know that I lost my beautiful girl Kaylee in June. And I'm transitioning to um, saying he versus she, but you'll see some of her in, in um, the videos in this presentation. So here's what we're gonna be talking about today. I've got a lot of stuff, a, a lot of stuff, a lot of information to share with you. If you look at the graphic on the right, this is the layers of the rocket recall protocol. Today, we're just gonna be focusing on the bottom three layers. Uh, management, antecedent behavior and consequences, important in helping you be successful with your dog in training, and then the check-in game and the name game. Those are the focus and attention games. So we're going to be talking about concepts, concepts I want you to keep in mind that are important before you even start training your dog, why management is important, what it is, why we do it, understanding the ABCs of training. The trainers will under know what that means, antecedent behavior and consequence, how dogs learn, and con consequently, that's how people learn too. Building a reinforcement hierarchy and the details uh, of the check-in game and the name game, which are the foundation exercises to rocket recall. Some other games to help strengthen attention, important problem solving training speed bumps so we're going to do all that in an hour and a half hour and 45 minutes and how do you train around prey here are the learning objectives i want you to grasp the concepts that i'm going to be talking about i'll tell you a little story about the evolution of you know how this came about and how i developed my training philosophy some finished behavior examples. What is it supposed to look like when your dog is focused on you? What's it supposed to look like when you're training it? I want you to understand the details of the games that I use. Supporting training games. How do you fit your training into a busy life? I'm sure there's not one person here that doesn't have a really busy life and wonders, how can I fit that in? Um, and then importantly, there are always going to be speed bumps crop up in training, even when you're doing everything right. So I want you to understand how to climb over speed bumps. Here are the concepts. Trust. I'm going to go through each one of the individually. Don't so um, know that. Trust and choice. Safety and joy for all learners. Give you a framework for training success. Systematic and progressive training exercises are going to take you through acquisition, fluency, generalization, and maintenance. I'll talk about what those are later. Generous and consistent reinforcement. Ding, ding, ding. Reinforcement drives behavior, increases it. And then affirming or adjusting for success. 
So let's talk about trust first. It is the, the umbrella that's after safety over everything. I want my dog to always trust me. I want my client to always trust me. And I want my dog to have choice and my client to have choice. I want choice in my life. If an animal or a person doesn't have choice, we become frustrated. Um, we don't have the ability to flourish. So no matter what your training issue is in front of you, today we're talking about focus and attention, but no matter what that training issue is, know that once you develop trust with your learner, that the seemingly impossible becomes possible. It's happened with us, it happens with our clients all the time. Safety and joy for all learners. Your dog needs to feel safe in order to learn. If, if they're not feeling physically safe or emotionally safe, learning is inhibited, if not impossible. And I wanna make training fun. I want it to be fun for me. I want it to be fun for my dog. I want us to, I want us to have fun together. I'm a firm believer that if, if we've got the safety um, umbrella over us, the big trust umbrella there as well, that we're gonna, fun is next and we're gonna have fun. I'm gonna take you through a, what I think is a recipe for success. So you're gonna, just like, just like we follow a recipe to bake a cake, certain things have to be put in that recipe mixed together first before you can put in something later. Um, that's what the systematic protocol does, um, I think, and helps dogs be successful and clients be successful, helps you be successful with your dog. Again, systematic and progressive exercises. These exercises are designed to work together. And we start with one and gain success there, but before we add in a second layer, gain success there before we add in a third layer. When your dog is first starting to learn, they're in the acquisition phase of learning. They're acquiring the skill to be able to do the behavior, whether that's a sit, whether that's uh, um, focusing on you, whether that's name recognition, recognition, they're acquiring the skill. Then they have to come, become fluent at that so that it happens frequently and easily. How we help them learn anywhere and any time, we have to generalize that behavior. So if we're working on attention, we have to work on that exercise, that behavior, training that behavior in a lot of different environments before the dog understands, oh, I can, I can focus on you in the house, I can focus on you in the yard, I can focus on you when we're walking in the, the um, suburb. We can, I can focus on you when we're at tractor supply. I can focus on you when I'm around prey. Take, may take a little while to get to the prey piece, but you can do it. And then there's maintenance. If a behavior isn't continued, if you, if you don't continue to reinforce the behavior, you're going to lose it. And I'm gonna tell you a story about that later on. So uh, just know that once you've trained a behavior, you can't just stop practicing or stop re reinforcing your dog for it because they'll lose that skill. And all it takes um, is short sessions to of maintenance to keep that training solid automatic you want to train through those four terms acquisition fluency generaliz generalization maintenance i call them the four stages of learning so the behavior becomes automatic your dog doesn't even have to think about what they're doing when you say their name they immediately look at you and wait for further instructions and it's like brake lights so I would bet that all of you, when you're driving in traffic, the moment you see a brake light, it's easier for you to put your foot on the brake and stop. It's automatic. You don't have to think, light in front of me got brighter. Okay, that means take my, fo my foot off the accelerator, put on the brake, put pressure on the brake in order to make the car stop. I don't know if you remember when you first started driving, that might have been not so easy to do 
until you practiced it for a while. And then as you practiced it over and over and practice maybe driving around your neighborhood and then with your parents in the car and then finally by yourself, it becomes automatic. You don't think what you're doing. You see a brake light and the brakes are on and you're going to uh, keep yourself safe. Generous and consistent reinforcement. Can't say this enough. Um, reinforcement is what drives behavior. So we want your dog to feel like they're having a party when you're training them and they're going to be getting a paycheck for all the things they do well when you're training them. And we're gonna set you up for success so they always get it right or almost always. Affirming or adjusting for success. I like to think that when I'm training, I have no bad days, meaning I'm not going to judge my training session. My role as my dog's trainer is to do the best I can for setting them up for success and help them succeed at whatever task I'm training. If the dog doesn't achieve what I have in mind or what I have written down, I don't need to judge that. That's just merely information. Maybe there were too many distractions. Maybe I didn't have the right value of a reinforcer for him. But I don't want you to judge your, your training sessions with your dog. You're really only affirming or adjusting for success. Those are not my words. Those are Steve White's words from Proactive Canine. I love that I was in a webinar with him recently. Um, and I've always just said, don't judge it. It's not bad, right? There's, it's, you can't say it's good or bad. But I love the way he said, when you're working with your dog, all you're doing during that session is you either affirming what they did right by reinforcing them or adjusting something so that the dog can succeed and then get reinforced. So remember, no bad days. So how did I come up with training attention and focus the way I do? There are so many influences over the 18 years that I can't even name them all, uh, but I'll, I'll kind of give you the very cliff note version of, of how it occurred. Abby, our very first dog, I, I call her my first canine teacher. She taught me so much. Brad and I were, oh, six or seven years into our marriage, I guess. And she bounded out of the woods when I was hiking, skinny, scrawny, mangy dog that followed me home um, over Brad's desire. <laughs> and we both fell in love with her. We wanted her to be a well-behaved dog. So we started calling around Marietta, Georgia, where we lived at the time, to find a dog training school to take her to. So this is 1996, good while ago and found a, a training center that was, oh, within 10 minute drive probably, and took her through six weeks of what I now know was an aversive training class. The first night of class, we were issued a mat, a choke chain, a prong collar, um, and a little three inch chain, like a choke chain, but it was only three or four inches. And that was to throw with the dog. Anyway, um, we went through those six weeks of training and she did pretty well. Um, she graduated, you know, I felt top of the class. But she didn't really like going into the training center. We didn't really understand at the time what we were seeing, but we got out of the car and she put her brakes on. She didn't want to go into that training center. And so we continued on. We wanted to, you know, continue teaching her, but and we didn't pay attention to her behavior. We didn't really know what we were seeing. We added Carter, our first Australian Shepherd, and he ended up being the catalyst for change. We took him back to that training center. At the time, we were living in, now living in North Carolina, driving two hours to that same class. He did well. By the time we were finishing that last class, Abby didn't even want to get out of the car. We, again, didn't quite understand what we were seeing, but knew that she wasn't happy. That was the key. We knew she wasn't happy. 
I decided I wanted to do agility with Carter and learned about positive reinforcement and thought, oh my gosh, I can, I started buying books. There was nobody to take lessons from around here. Started buying books, found out about positive reinforcement and said, oh my gosh, it can be this easy. I can reinforce my dog for what I want. I don't have to hurt him to train him. I've got immediate buy-in. He's an enthusiastic learner. I was sold. Started searching for more knowledge, just wanted to learn a little bit more, never meant to be a, a dog trainer. That was not my intention at the time. Be careful. Um, you can get bitten by the bug. And so I gained professional knowledge and it took me to a new career as a professional dog trainer. I've learned from so many industry leaders. Um, Pat Miller is my mentor, wonderful friend and um, I, I learned so much from her and I've learned from every single person I've, I've taken a webinar from, every student I've talked to, I've honed my own skills with my own dogs over and over again. What really prompted me to think about how do I, how do I teach attention and focus to someone else was with when my girl Willow. Um, joined our home. We used to have outdoor play sessions here at our home, 10 people, 10 dogs. And it was her name response and recall during off-leash play that really caused me to really want to put a protocol together that we could then start teaching our clients. And that came from a, um, a, an attendee to our play session who said, how did you do that? How did you call her away from those other dogs? She listens to you. And I said, you train it. Then I thought, well, how do I train that? So th that's how the protocol uh, came about. I still learn every day from my students. Um, I, I don't see clients anymore, but I work with professional, aspiring professional dog trainer students. And so, wow, they teach me things every day and their dogs teach me everything. And my dog, my new dog has taught me new things as well. The more I learn, the less I know. management another concept that's really important so what does management mean i think a good way to explain it is counter surfing um, management means manipulating the dog's environment so their the unwanted behavior is prevented from being reinforced while you're training a new behavior so if i want to train my dog to sit quiet, not quietly, but sit nicely in the kitchen while I'm prepping dinner, I need to start that when the counters are clean. There's no food. I can't have food up there on the counter that might cause him to, to jump up, get food, and then leave the kitchen. If he jumps up and gets food, that's reinforcing to him. Reinforcement causes behavior to happen again, and he's more likely to jump on the counter again. So while I'm training him to keep four on the floor in the kitchen, I need to keep all the counters clean and clear while I'm reinforcing him for keeping food on, uh, feet on the ground. And just so you know, when I am teaching a dog to keep their feet on the ground in the kitchen, I'm, I'm putting that reinforcement on the floor so it drives their behavior down toward the floor. You wanna create a management strategy for focus and attention, the management strategy is really easy. A six foot leash and a long line. Your regular six foot leash, the long line, or I call a long leash as well, can be 15 to 20 feet. It can be, can be a lot of different um, materials. I happen to like a material called biothane. Uh, it's a man-made material. It doesn't absorb water. It's um, It can get dirty, but the dirt doesn't work into it like it does in a cotton line, and it's very easy to clean. On the right is the biothane line. They come in colors. I have a purple one and a blue one. I'm a purple and a blue girl. And then on the left is just my, my normal um, leather leash. I want you to understand that no matter where you're training, attention and focus or recall, whether it's in your yard, it's at the park with other people around. I want you to know you're using that leash as an effective tool to help take your dog to the next level of success. Your leash is not a crutch. It is not um, 
at all. It's not a crutch. It's also not a steering wheel and it's not a communication tool. Your leash is really a safety tool that keeps your dog safe while you're helping them learn the skills that may take you to eventually being off leash in safe places with them. Yay for long lines and leashes. So with management, I want you to learn to be a wise manager. So here is a student ready to work with their beautiful Husky dog. They have their treat bag on, the treat bag is filled with food. They're going to click or train or use a verbal marker, perhaps if they don't have their uh, hand on the clicker. They have the leash, the dog's on a harness, they're ready to train. So if, if this person had trained inside and was ready to start training outside, they would pick a quiet environment. You can assume that this is quiet. You don't see any squirrels that I've, I've added into the illustration. You're ready to train um, and you're managing your dog by making sure that he's going to stay close to you while you move through the training games that I'm going to describe. So be a wise manager. The ABCs of training, antecedents, behavior, and consequence. And antecedents are a contributing factor to your dog's behavior. The behavior is the response the dog has as a result of those contributing factors, the things that come before the behavior. And then the consequence is what happens after the dog's behavior that makes it more or less likely to happen again. So contrast that last picture you saw. If the, if the person um, the person were with the husky dog, the dog wasn't on uh, in a harness or on a leash. The person might have had food on with them, but maybe they just walked outside of their house to do some training, not on leash. They were off leash. They got ready to set up and and capture uh, a look from the dog to the person and a squirrel ran by. More than likely, the squirrel would get the dog's attention. The dog would lock onto the squirrel, eyes on the squirrel, and the dog would run off. Ineffective arrangement of all of those things, antecedents that were contributing factors that, dog beha that dog's behavior, that dog ran off. So when you're using a leash or a long line, you can, as best we can in that environment, make sure that the consequence, the dog's success is going to get reinforced. Dog's success looks at you, gets reinforced. The, the, the um, likelihood of that behavior happening again is going to increase. ABCs. Steve White of Proactive Canine says, if you've got murky behavior, it's because of unclear antecedents or consequences or both. Clean up the antecedents and the consequences, and the behavior really takes care of, its, uh, of itself. So in addition to becoming a, um, a good manager, I want you to become a master at manipulating all those things in the environment before you even start training your dog. ABCs, and that's an illustration of our dog. Cody. How dogs learn. I could do four hours on this topic and I'm not, I hope I won't make your eyes glaze over, but I do want you to learn a little bit about how dogs learn. It's how people learn as well. And I'm gonna take you through the, the truly, the, what won't fit, uh, what will barely fit on the tip of a pen. But I want you to know about operant conditioning, and I want you to know about classical conditioning. Operant conditioning is the dog is, is, is this good for me or is this bad for me? Dogs are always thinking. People are always thinking, hmm, was this good for me or was this bad for me? Classical conditioning is, is this safe for me or is this dangerous for me? Take you into each one of them. This graphic describes it um, well. So take look at the graphic and then I'll talk you through with some um, terms on the left. Operant conditioning, we have um, Skinner, scient uh, scientist Skinner to thank for that. 
Consequences drive behavior. So the consequence of the behavior is what helps, helps it increase or decrease. We want your dog's focus and attention to increase. There are four processes of operant conditioning. There's positive reinforcement, positive punishment, negative reinforcement, and negative punishment. You have to put on your scientist's hat or your accountant's hat when you think of positive or negative. Doesn't mean happy and bad. Positive means something is added to the training environment in order to uh, increase behavior. And negative means, or the word negative means something that is taken away. So positive reinforcement, we're adding something. In our case, the dog looks at you, gives you attention, you're going to reinforce with a piece of food. Of those four quadrants, look at the right. This is what I think dogs feel or clients feel, learners feel, any learner feels when they're uh, when they're using po or positive reinforcement is used in a training situation with them. So that could be in the classroom. It could be your dog working with you. Delight. Positive punishment, the dog feels distress. I don't know if any of you were positively punished as a child, but um, I certainly felt some distress. There was only one or two times in my life um, that that happened because my dad was a clinical psychologist and actually studied Skinner. So there's a lot of positive reinforcement in her house. With negative punishment, taking the good stuff away from a dog, such as a timeout, the dog might feel dismayed. And the, with negative reinforcement, the dog might feel relief. I don't want my dog to feel distressed. I don't want them to feel dismayed. And I don't want them to feel relief from something that I stopped doing. I want them to feel delight. So please always choose positive reinforcement as, the, um, the, as your philosophy, as I do. So that was operant conditioning. This is classical conditioning. And yes, that's me. Doesn't look like me, but this is my feeling about spiders. It might be a teeny tiny spider down here at my feet, but let me tell you, in my that spider seems that big to me. I cannot control myself around spiders. Logically, I know that spider, little teeny spider wouldn't hurt me, but I cannot control my physical response. Just I almost have a phobia about them. So classical conditioning, the dog is making an association every moment in response to a certain stimulus. And so are you. Um, you walk into a room, you, you have a feeling about that room. Is it good? Do you have a, a happy feeling about being in that room? Are people jovial, communicating, saying, hello, how are you, welcome? Or do you walk in and everybody's looking down and not paying attention and, and there, you feel tension in the room? You want your dog to always be making a happy association with your training situation. And you don't want them to have um, a fearful response like I do to the spiders. We're going to be using food to reinforce your dog. Um, for the, the training games that I'm going to share with you. And I want you to think about developing a reinforcement hierarchy. Um, in our two-day workshops that we used to do, we spent a whole afternoon on developing a reinforcement hierarchy. And I'm going to give you um, a way to do that today. Even when you end this presentation, you can start jotting down um, some distractions and reinforcers. So it's important to understand the value and timing of reinforcers and how they make a difference in your dog's success. A reinforcer is a stimulus that increases the chance of the desired response. Timing, the value and timing is important, as I just said. And I want you to understand that there are a multitude of foods available as reinforcers. We oftentimes buy prepackaged treats, whatever those may be. Be creative. In addition to the prepackaged treats that you can buy, think about stinky, smelly, um, soft foods 
that your dog might like. I have had a veterinary behaviorist I worked with once. We were working with a really reactive, fearful dog. And we could come up with nothing that this dog would eat. And even though the dog was well under threshold, I mean, we weren't, the dog was at a, at a um, we, under threshold, the dog wasn't stressed. When dogs are too stressed, they won't eat. So, um, but we had, we had eliminated all the things that might possibly bother this dog. The only two things that he would eat were ginger snaps for training and whipped cream out of a, a um, aerosol container. Veterinary behaviors is what suggested that. It's like sweets. She said in moderation, but it it served her well in certain instances. And for this dog, it served me well. That's not something you're going to use for training, focus, and attention. Reinforcement should be immediate. So the moment your dog looks at you, you're going to mark it and reinforce it. We're going to talk about that further in the games. Your written reinforcement hierarchy. Come up with, on the left here, you see distractions. And these are my girl Kaylee. These were a few of her distractions. I want to challenge you to come up with 10 to 20 distractions, things that distract your dog. So for Kaylee, here are things that distracted her bunnies, squirrels, the UPS truck, deer, other dogs, people, and then birds, cats, and blowing leaves. I just made a list of 10 to 20 distractions, and then I prioritized those or leveled those, if you will, and came up with mm, hot, the, hot, the highest thing that's really hard for, for her to focus on me around are bunnies, squirrels, and when the UPS truck is in the driveway. The other ones, the deer, the dog, the person, those ended up being medium distractions. And then the low level distractions were birds flying by, or cats walking by, or leaves walking by, or leaves blowing in the wind. We live in the country and we have a lot of trees, so there are a lot of leaves blowing. Then I made a list of 10 to 20 reinforcers, and then I leveled those high, medium, and low. The reason I did that is because I want to make sure that as my training increases and I move from training inside to out of doors to, to around higher level distractions, I'm using the right level of reinforcer. So I pair low level reinforcers with um, Happy Howie's, um, Kibble, and dried banana slices. Kaylee loved dried banana slices, salt free sugar-free. Those were low value. Chicken, tug, and cheese, those were sort of medium value for her. And then high level reinforcers, her tucket ball, I always called that the thing she loved more than me, um, freeze-dried salmon, and squirrels. Now, not all distractions can be reinforcers. But some distractions can be used as reinforcers, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later in the presentation. So take the time, write out 10 to 20 distractions, then 10 to 20 reinforcers. Your distractions, again, you're going to rate those low, medium, high, reinforcers, low, medium, high, and then pair those up so that you're using the right level of reinforcer around the right distraction and you will be you will you will set your dog up for success and set yourself up for success um, if you do that here's a training equipment that i use a front or back clip harness a marker signal i'm i don't know if everyone is familiar with marker training or clicker training i'm going to talk about that a little bit later uh, give you the cliff note version of that a wearable treat bag. I want you to have food on you at all times while you're training. A six foot fixed length leash, a 15 to 20 foot fixed length leash, or what I call a long line, your low, medium, and value reinforcers. And please keep those separately. Don't mix them together. You want your you want to 
to, with educated thought, be able to move from a low value to a medium value reinforcer or medium to high value, depending on the distraction. Um, if I was working for, um, I like broccoli. I, I would work for broccoli. I even like cottage cheese and I would work for cottage cheese. Brad does not like cottage cheese. Cottage cheese could be a reinforcer for me, would not be for Brad. So if he'd been working and receiving, let's say chicken for something he did well, and then someone said, mix it in with the cottage cheese and there was a little cottage cheese on that chicken, it wouldn't, um, it wouldn't be motivating for him. So please keep your reinforcers separate. Water for your dog and you if you need to, and closed toed shoes for you. Um, I, I ask all of my clients to please, and students, to please wear closed toed shoes because you're gonna be moving with your dog. I want you to be safe and I want your dog to be safe from any tripping that might happen with you should you fall um, towards your dog. The most important thing is a willingness to learn. You all have that, you're here, thank you. Goal behavior examples. I think it's always nice to see um, what you're striving for. And so here's a video of my girl, Kaylee. This, I'm, I'm actually calling her to me from in the back of the pasture, but I want you to know that before I could even call her, she saw me and she started running toward me before I called her. So I hope you can see the cursor on my screen. It's right in the middle of the screen. So if you can see the sunlight sort of in the middle of the screen, she's somewhere up around there as I start this video and I'll be talking through the video. So I'll let the video do the talking for me. Brad and the dogs headed out before me for our morning walk. I see Kaylee on a scent of something out there. They're way back behind the second barn, the old barn. I'm gonna sneak up here. Oh, I see her up at the top of the pasture. The knoll and Cody. He's deaf, so he doesn't hear a recall cue. But Kaylee will. So I'm trying to get to where, she, where I can call her and then she catches sight of me. Over the hill, hold your ears, I'm gonna call her. Kaylee, go, go, go. And she started running to me before I could even get my yes. recall cue she out. She saw me before I called. So, because of all the work we've done with the recall training and training focus, the moment she sees me, you'll run toward me. I love that, Kaylee. Go play. So I love that. I mean, in order to get um, certainly a recall in, successful recall, long distance recall, you have to start with the foundation games of teaching your dog to focus on you and having name response. So her name response is immediate and then her recall is also immediate and I'll share this with you. Okay, hold your ears. She's down by the house. You'll there see she her is, bottom right of the screen. Down here. There she comes. What a good girl. Look at you. Good job, baby girl. Nice job. And that all started all right. we go find with Let's go. foundation and attention, the check-in games. So again, name response when she's playing with another dog. I have to get her attention first before I can then Kaylee, call her away go. from yes. another dog. Good girl. Let's go. Come on. Just feed him. Don't feed her. At least try. Actually, don't feed either one of them if they're together. Kaylee, this way. Come, come, come. So that Good was my re that was my recall cue that got her to me that time. 
All right. Take a short little breathing break. Inhale deeply. Exhale. And this is a good time, Deborah, if anyone has questions from the first part of this presentation, I'd love to be able to answer those. Okay. Um, one has to do with training service dogs when you don't want to put food on the floor. You know, uh, oops, I went ahead on my presentation. I didn't mean to do that. Hold on. Uh, let me get back to where I was. So because I don't train service dogs, um, I only know what um, I've been told from others. And that is you can have reinforcement come from a bowl or something nearby if you if you can't feed the dog to their mouth. So you can train the dog to receive reinforcement from a different uh, vessel, if you will, as opposed to giving the dog food. Okay. Um, and this question comes up at every webinar. How do you positively reinforce a dog who isn't that interested in treats or food? Okay, so that's a really good question. And I'm glad that you shared that question. Dogs who won't eat. First of all, dogs have to have food to live. Dog Food is a primary reinforcer. If a dog doesn't eat, they're either too aroused or they're overly stressed. They're over their stress threshold. So it will be important to understand which one of those is that. It may be the dog is in too, too much of an arousing environment or too much of a, of a fear, they're fearful of that environment and won't take food. Another reason I've seen dogs not be um, really food motivated is when they're free fed, they have access to food all day, every day. It's better to feed your dog um, two meals, one meal or two meals a day. Veterinarians will also agree with me on this. Um, if your dog has food out all day, every day, it's like having the Thanksgiving buffet out all day. And while that food was really good early in the morning, by the end of the day, you're like you're kind of tired of looking at it and eating the same thing over and over. So I would I would say I would challenge a person to say, figure out, be creative with your reinforcers, try a wide variety of of foods, see what your dog might work for and start in an environment where your dog can take food, where they feel safe, where they can feel comfortable and they're not too aroused. Okay. Um, someone else wanted to know why you're using a harness instead of a regular collar. Good question. Um, I I like to protect my dog's esophagus and trachea should they um, inadvertently pull towards something or run towards something. If a squirrel would run by and they run quickly, I don't want that collar to hurt their neck. For me, a collar is a place to, uh, to attach ID tags and not to hook my leash to. I really like a back clip or a front, front, front clip harness because it protects that dog's neck. There's too many neck injuries of dogs, even on flat collars. Um, so that's my reason for a harness. And it looks like that's it for now. Okay, great, wonderful. I'll move. Up move on and I've got to close my chat here. It's in my way. Bear with me a second. See if I can move it. There we go. Well, I can't for some reason. It's right in the middle of my screen. Oh, here it is. There we go. Okay. Now we're in the how-to part. So thank you for, for letting me share with you concepts that are I think concepts I think that are important to every single thing you train, whether it's sit or down or recall or focus and attention. These exercises are just like the foundation of this building that they're getting ready to put up. They are what's going to help you then launch off into anything else you want to teach your dog, the checking game and the name game. 
I'm asked frequently, when should I begin training? Just know that it's never too early. If you've got a puppy, you can begin. If you have a senior muzzle, a gray muzzle, you can begin. It's never too early. It's never too late. When a client asks me, when should I begin training focus and attention? My answer is now. Now's a good time. Doesn't matter how old your dog is. Be assured your dog can learn no matter your dog's age. The check-in game. The check-in game is what you're going to be using to teach your dog to give you offered check-in. Your training goal for this behavior or this exercise, I guess I should say, is offered check-ins, whether your dog is on leash or off leash. We're going to be using marker training. And many of you probably know what this is, but uh, real quickly, when the dog gives me a behavior that I like, I'm in a market with a verbal yes or some other verbal word or a clicker. Or for me, I also use a palatal click, a mouth click. It took me a while to learn to do that. Um, so I'm using a clicker, a verbal yes. My verbal marker is yes. Um, or some other sound that you like to use that's short and salient to your dog. We're going to be utilizing capturing to train a behavior. What does that mean? Capturing means we're grabbing the whole behavior at once, marking it and reinforcing it. Your job as your dog's trainer is to be silent and observe them. And patience is required. I think it's really easy for us to want to try to help our dogs but we want them to learn themselves that looking at us and then is going to pay off because when they look at us, they're going to get reinforced for it. And that reinforcement is what helps that behavior happen again. You're going to be saying your marker word or clicking your clicker the moment your dog orients towards you or looks at you. And here's three examples again of the clicker using a verbal marker. Or for a deaf dog, for our guy Cody, who now has acquired deafness, we use a, um, a thumbs up or a hand flick with him to mark his behaviors now that he can't hear us any longer. And then you're going to remove eye contact and wait for the next um, opportunity of your dog to look at you. The check-in game. And repeat, of course. So here are the first phase of the check-in game, four different photos. You'll Each of these games has three different phases and they're designed to take you through phase one where you gain success there in one environment. Phase two, you gain success there in a different environment, a little bit more distracting environment. And then phase three in a more, even more distracting environment. Here, phase one is starting indoors off leash and then outside with your dog on a six foot leash. So in the photos, Brad is watching Cody. The moment Cody orients toward him, he marks that with a verbal marker and then he reinforces Cody with food. And then I do this, do the same with Kaylee down below. I have her on leash. I'm waiting for her to look at me. She looks at me. I mark it. She starts moving toward me in the photo here in the bottom right and then i reinforce her for that so again the goal is your dog offers attention to you regularly without your asking you're going to be inside your house or your yard and then your preparation you're going to be practicing first in a no distraction environment such as your room a quiet room in your home um, or outside with your dog on leash. And here's one of my first sessions with Keaton with name response. So puppy Keaton is, has been just a little bit aroused playing with toys here in my uh, training studio. And I have some very small pea sized pieces of food in my treat bag. Those pieces of food are going to be his paycheck for a job done well. And the job done well that I'm going to be working on is demonstrating the check-in game. So the check-in game 
is waiting for your dog to offer attention to you. Operative word, offer attention. You're gonna mark it with a verbal yes, and you're gonna reinforce him with a yummy piece of food. So I'm gonna place a piece of food away to get his attention away from me. Yes, he comes back. I can feed him to the mouth. I'm gonna reset him, move him away from me. There it is, sweet boy, right there. It's hard to see, right? Get him, get him. Right there, baby, there you go. Yes. So I don't care right now that he's looking me in the eyes. I'm just marking the fact that he's coming back toward me, which I like. This way, buddy. Ready? Get it. Yes. Good job. There it is. Get it. Yes. Good job. So he decides to lay down, that's okay. Yes, he looks me in the eyes. I love that, I mark it and reinforce it. Good job, buddy. Yes, his little eyes came up to look at me versus my tree hand, I love that. Yes, good boy, nice. I'm gonna toss a piece of food to reset him, go after that to give him the opportunity to give his attention back to me. Good. You notice he didn't look me in the eyes that time. I'm not waiting for that higher level of criteria. I'll mark it, of course, if he gives it to me. But my, the first thing I'm, I'm working on is just having him always orient back toward me. Are you a good boy? You are. Good job. Thank you. Okay. Good. Let's do one more. Keep me ready. Good boy. Okay. Go get it. This time I was waiting just to see if he would look me in the face. He did not. That's okay. He came over here and laid down. I'm going to put a piece of food so he'll move. There you go. Go get it. So in this video, I'm affirming or adjusting all the time. I'm having to adjust what I'm doing to help him be successful. In the face. Actually, actually in the eyes. Perfect. That was awesome, Betty. You're a good job. Take a break. You did a good job. As I was going through this presentation again this morning before we met, I realized you're going to watch him grow up because one of, one of the videos is just was taken last week. So Keaton grows up in, in an hour and a half. So here is Bebop. Um, this was um, this is a young woman that I met at, at a TV station that I do some presenting for. She's one of the camera people and she just did an amazing job with the check-in game. So I wanted to show her working with Bebop. This is the very first time she's ever working on this game and they do a great job of implementing it. Is that puppy not cute or what? So we don't try to rush the dog. We don't try to hurry the dog. We let the, the dog yeah. take it at their own pace. He's just being very patient with him. Good job, team. So here I'm on the six foot leash and I've taken training from inside to outside with Keaton. I'm observing him, just waiting for him to look at me. I mark it, I reinforce it letting him sniff around. He gets interested in some rabbit scent or rabbit poop over in the flowers. 
in just a minute. I know what he's doing. So I take a piece of food, put it in his nose, lure him away. Yes. Nice job. Yes. Excellent, buddy. So when I have my dog on leash with me, they are my focus. You know, I am, I'm scanning the environment, see where I'm going, what I'm doing, who might be approaching me, but Very nice. my dog is, is my focus. Keaton goes toward Brad because yes. Brad's filming. Excellent. Gives me a great opportunity when he looks back to mark and reinforce again. And then I take it to a different location on our property on a six foot leash, do some walking in our pasture. I wait for him to look up. I mark, I reinforce, I continue our walk. I let him stop and sniff. It's his walk. I'm just there to mark and reinforce. And then I take it to a different area on our property. Outside is distracting enough. So I don't want to be in any environment where I, there might be people or other cars passing beyond, by. I want to make sure I set him up for success. So I get the behavior I want looking at me and then he gets reinforced for that. I let him sniff. I mean, in essence, this is a dog led walk. I'm letting him take a sniffy walk and I'm marking and reinforcing when he looks at me. So problem solving, what are things that could inhibit um, success? It could be that your dog is too focused on you. So if that's the case, you might have to put a piece of food to the floor or ground behind the dog in order to reset them, as I did with Keaton a couple of times, to um, so he would have the opportunity to look back at me. If there are too many distractions, um, take any approximation of your dog looking at you. And I should say, if they're too distracted and you can't remove those distractions, maybe you take an ear flick towards you or a partial head turn towards you versus a look at you. And if you're not successful, move to a lower value um, or distraction area or raise the value of your reinforcer. You might need to move from kibble to cheese. And that would be my girls or my boys reinforcers now. So the phase two, you've graduated from a six foot leash to a 15 foot leash. And, and again, I call that a long line. I use both of those terms sort of interchangeably. Your goal behavior is the same thing. Dog offers attention without your asking. This time you're gonna be in a low distraction area in your yard or known locations around your home, places your dog's been before. And I want you to practice first in your yard before you go to other low distraction environments. So here I am working with Keaton again at home. This time I'm in a long line. I have some of that line gathered up because I don't want to want 15 feet out in the beginning. I want to make sure I get the behavior I want. He's looking at me before I then let out more of that line. I eventually do. I do think when we're training these behaviors, all of a sudden the dog thinks, wow, it can be this easy. All I have to do is look at you and I get food. How cool is that? Yes. So I, I yes. don't know if you noticed, but I let out more line there. Cool. Then Keaton moves a little bit toward Brad. And then I think he decides to take a potty break, if I remember correctly. Yes. Good boy. Oh, yeah. Good boy. That was nice. That was lovely. Good. Let's take a break. 
problem solving. Similar to phase one, the dog may be too distracted. If so, shorten the line or return to a six foot leash. You might need to move to a lower distraction area or change the value of your reinforcer. And let me say this too. Um, I was training with Keaton the other day and I had to change the value of my reinforcer, but I had to lower the value of the reinforcer. The reinforcer I had was way too valuable. He was just too excited about what I had in my hands to uh, work on the behavior that we were working on. So I actually had to go down in value. That could happen to you as well. Phase three of the check-in game, we've the dog is now off leash. Much harder job because they're not attached to you by a leash. Goal behavior is the same. Your dog offers attention regularly without your asking. You're going to be in your yard or other safely fenced, varied locations. Operative words, safely fenced. I don't want you to ever to be off leash with your dog in an area that isn't safe. My dog's life is precious to me and I, <clears throat> um, I want to make sure that they're safe. You want to gain success first in your yard before you move to other low distraction areas around your community. So this, these photos were taken in the back pack up back part of our pasture that's fenced. And so here I'm working with Keaton. Taking a stroll with him, keeping my eyes on him. He looks at me, I mark and reinforce. He doesn't come to me for that reinforcer. Something's really exciting, so I go to him and deliver it. He earned it. So I put the food behind him there because he was starting to follow me around. I love that. <laughs> I like that he wants to be with me, but I was specifically working on this exercise and wanted to capture his look at me to reinforce that. Then I moved to a different area of our pasture. So I train in different areas around our property before I then would start um, doing on-leash work um, in a, a more populated area. We take advantage of working on a trick while we're also working on the checking game off-leash. He doesn't want to lead me, yay, the byproduct. So here's Puppy Kaylee, little girl off leash in the pasture, starting this process with her. Okay, let's go. I'm just letting her romp about, do what she wants to in the pasture grass. So this would be an example of it's never too early. Good girl. Nice. There you go. Good job. You ready? Let's go. So this is Keaton. This is a few months ago. We were just taking a morning walk in the pasture off leash. He saunters, actually trotted over the hill. We're taking our normal walk and ah, check in. Yes, good boy. I was waiting for him to come back over the knoll and hopefully look at me. He did. Good boy. That was a lovely check in, buddy. Let's go.
problem solving. I want to make sure what we watched. That was, yeah, that's the one we watched. Somehow I got ahead of myself. Problem solving is somewhat similar, as you may notice the trend here. Um, if at any time the exercise isn't successful, think about moving to a lower value, excuse me, lower distraction area or raising the value of your reinforcer. For, for all of the dogs that I've trained, client dogs included, when we move to a more distracting environment, we've got to go up in their the value of their paycheck. I think of the reinforcement, the reinforcer that I give my dog is their paycheck for doing a job done well. If moving doesn't help, then you may need to go back to the phase two of the exercise and train there a while before you start forward again. But remember, don't judge your success. It's just merely information. Just information. If I can, my dog doesn't do it here, I'll move back to where he was last successful, gain um, Barb Buckmeyer. I'm studying herding now. And I love the way she says, you need to put a lot of mass on your behaviors. So gain more mass. You know, which means your dog is going to be reinforced more times for that behavior so it'll be stronger before you move to the next uh, phase of the game. So the name game. The training goal is your dog immediately looks toward you when their name is spoken. The dog's name is a cue to look at you. You cue the name, Keaton, and then I would mark that with a verbal yes or my clicker and i might mark any approximation of recognition certainly they're going to turn their start turning their head toward me i really like to mark that behavior when their neck starts turning toward me i'm going to reinforce it always praise them remove eye contact and then repeat photos of the six foot Phase, phase one on a six foot leash. The goal behavior is when you say your dog's name, he, he or she immediately turns his head toward you. You're gonna start inside your house or your yard on a six foot leash. And you're gonna practice first in a no distraction environment, such as a quiet room inside your house with your dog off leash. If you're inside, outside you need to be on leash, of course. Remember, you want to manage those antecedents so you set your dog up for success. Here's how I teach. First of all, think about your dog's name. It's merely a sound to them. If you have a new dog in your home, they don't know their name. We've chosen a name that we love, but this is how you can teach your dog his or her name. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lisa Wagoner with Cold Nose College, and this is my new puppy, Willow. We're going to teach you a little bit and a much younger me and puppy willow um, to pay attention to me when i said her name so when i am working with my dog and i say my dog's name <laughs> what that means is look at me and wait for further instruction it doesn't mean get out of the trash quit chasing the cat get out of the garbage um, i want the dog to immediately when i say their name look at me and then wait for further instruction willow wandered off because you know she's a puppy she has a short attention span and there's some cool toys over there so the first thing I'm going to do is just say her name and feed a piece of food Willow 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 I'm pairing her name with yummy food Willow not asking for anything Willow good girl Willow good girl Willow and I'm always going to say my dog's name, Willow, in a happy tone of voice. Willow, good girl. Willow, good girl. Willow, good girl. Willow, good girl. Now I need to go get some more food, and we'll move on to round two, which is where I'm going to toss a treat. She'll go get it. Then I'm going to say her name. When she looks at me, I'm going to mark it with a yes. Then I'm going to toss a treat in the other direction. So here we are ready for round two. This second step, I'm going to toss a treat. She's going to go get it. While she's eating it, I'm going to say her name. And when she looks at me, I'm going to mark it with a yes and toss the treat the other direction. You ready? 
power. Okay. Voila! Yes! Voila! Yes! Voila! Yes! Voila! Yes! This was an exercise that I learned from yes. Steve White when we, when Willow Willa, was a puppy yes. and we were taking a workshop with him. Willa, yes. You ever have a chance to, to learn from him? Willa, He's wonderful. Yes. Willa, yes. Good girl. Very nice. Good job. So do that with 10 or 15 treats. Once you have that kind of success inside in a no distraction environment, then you can move to a slightly more distracting environment continue working on it uh, in the midst of distractions so, so your puppy learns or dog learns um, to pay attention to you in a more distracting environment. Willow! Yay! Puppy, puppy! And of course, if you decided to move, take that outside, you'd want to have your dog on a six-foot leash. So here I'm with Keaton on a six-foot leash outside. And he's grown since you last saw him. Maybe not too much yet. I let him go where he wants to go, sniff what he wants to sniff. We almost get off screen. He decides to, I think it might have been the leash getting tight that caused him to look back at me that time, but that's okay. I reinforced it anyway. Problem solving for phase one of the name game is if your dog won't look away or won't look away from you, you're going to need to toss a treat, not unlike I did with Willow. If too focused on you, you might invite a friend over to work with you as a distraction so they could um, maybe just their slight movement or uh, rustling their feet might cause your dog to look away so they you could have the opportunity to say your dog's name. And instead of repeating your dog's name, you want to make another sound, kissy noise or a squeaky noise. It may take a little while for your dog to learn to give you that immediate response but don't repeat their name. If you repeat their name over and over, they just um, will not pay attention to that. They their name becomes ir irrelevant. It's called learned irrelevance. Kind of like my mother when she used to say, Lisa, come and learn the dishwasher. It was about the 10th time she'd say that before I'd actually go do it. Phase two, we're on a 15 foot leash. So here's Cody and Brad um, in the photo with all of that line laid out. Same goal. When you say your dog's name, the dog immediately turns his head towards you. I want you to be in your yard or other low distraction areas away from your home. And again, practice first in your yard before you take the training to other low distraction areas in your community. An example is um, the park on Sunday morning versus Saturday when it might be more busy. Lowe's or tractor supply on Sunday mornings when there may be less people than there are on Saturday afternoons. Always think about setting your dog up for success so they can they can achieve the goal you've set for them in that particular training environment. Here's Melanie and Haas working on the name game in our back pasture. Melanie does a good job of being patient and just Hi. observing Haas and waiting for him and to I give do. her attention. And I do. I like what your decision there to click the moment he started turning, um, especially in an environment that's this distracting for him. Um, we don't want to wait for that eye contact. We can start clicking any approximation of that. Look at that face. He is so cute. So she dropped a treat or part of a treat. So he's eating the treat. 
she's just really patient, doesn't rush him. I love that. And when he decides to start moving toward her, she marks and reinforces that. That was a really nice decision on her part. Phase three, we're moving off leash again. The goal is the same goal. Even off leash, I, when I say my dog's name, I want him to immediate look, immediately turn his head toward me. I'm going to be practicing again in my yard before I practice in low distraction areas with him off leash. And I want to make sure that the first two phases of the name game are solid. I can do those. He can achieve those. I can certainly do them, but can he do them? So here is Keaton off leash as a young puppy working on phase three of the name game. You look so little under that tree, buddy. See, that's because I am. Good boy. Yes, good. He decides to run toward me. Definitely want to reinforce that. Keaton, yes. So he was going after deer poop, was able to interrupt him. Let's go, buddy. You love deer poop, don't you, huh? Yes, yes, yes. Farm boy. The boy still loves deer poop. So here, he's grown up exponentially now. This is last week. And I uh, happened to pull my video out and thought, this would be great. I could use um, this footage in the presentation. So I am um, working on the name game and the check-in game while we're sniffing around. He's sniffing around Tractor Supply. Keaton? Yes, good boy. Nice job. There you go, kid. Lovely. That was lovely. So I go to Tractor Supply or Glows and I just say, okay, buddy, take me where you want to take me. I let him sniff and an indoor sniffy walk. Keaton, this way. Yes, good boy. Nice job. Good job. Good boy, let's go this way. Oh, the bone, the meaty bones. Keaton. Yes, what a good boy. So I'm gonna go back here a little bit and just let you know my decision making process he's sniffing some food that's packaged right those meaty bones stinky smoked bones those are i can cons consider really high value things that he's sniffing so i wait for him to sniff those disengage from it before i say his name so i'm making decision about how do i set him up for success so that even though he's sniffing something that's really attractive to him that he will um, leave it and look at you look at me when I give him his his cue. I could eventually work to where I could call him off of this, um, but I'm just trying to set him up for success. So I wait until he's just past it, then I say his name. Yes, what a good boy! Nice job. That was lovely. And so now that looks like urine to me. I can't tell what it is, but he was really interested in that even more than the meaty bones. I say his name, he doesn't look at me. So that's yes, when I made boy, another kissy noise to try to get his attention so I could um, then reinforce him. And I think he got something yummy there.
our last week tractor supply run when it was raining. So those, we, I took you through phase one, phase two, and three of both the check-in game and the name game. This is hide and seek. Hide and seek is a, a game that I use to strengthen recall and also to strengthen um, focus and attention. It's fun for you. It's fun for your dog. It builds desire for your dog to find you. As I just said, it strengthens focus and attention and certainly also strengthens recall. You're going to be practicing it in your inside first, making it easy. I start in the house. Um, I, um, I let Brad distract the dog or hold the dog and then I go hide somewhere and then let them find me. You might need to make a noise if they're not keen to start looking for you right away, some dogs aren't, um, and then celebrate and throw a party when they find you. Then you can gradually increase the difficulty both inside um, and then go play outside. Here are some hide and seek games that I play with Keaton. So he's eating a treat. Perhaps I dropped a treat. Oh, I was gonna hide from him. Okay, so now I'm gonna go. I may need to make a noise to alert him that I've moved. Yes, I was worried he also is a puppy that he might be concerned if I was out of sight too long. So I start peeking around the side of the old barn. Ah, he's noticed that I'm gone, but didn't know where I went. Yay, you found me, good boy. That was awesome, my boy. Good job. Good job, kiddo. Excellent. Keaton ran off up the path to the other side of the pasture. So I decided I would hide behind a tree or at least stay here until I see him and hopes that he'll miss my presence and start So I didn't know, you know, he, he'd gone away on the other side of the pasture. I thought, will he really start looking for me? Maybe he will. Here so he I stayed me. hidden. So I'm going to duck behind this tree. So the tree blocks me from his view. Where's my puppy? So I tried to give him a little help there by saying, where's my puppy? He didn't hear me. He continues on. I just patiently watch. He's retracing our path. <laughs> Yay! You found me! Keaton, that was great, buddy! That was awesome! That was fabulous. You found me. Yay, let's go. So Keaton ran off ahead of me. And another go chance to hide when he darted Over away here. from me. I'm at a different in the woods. side of our pasture in another wooded area. Let's see. You found me, good boy. Good job. Good job. All right, let's go. And here I was at a lake with a friend on a private, not a private, an uninhabited small island where I felt comfortable having him off leave. And I just darted away. He was playing in the water with his friend, Ernie. One thing I want to say, a big caveat about playing hide and seek with a dog. If your dog suffers from separation anxiety and is stressed when you're out of their sight, please don't play hide and seek with them. Um, it could be that you could still play the game in the house and in, in the context the dog would know, but um, please always um, 
take your dog's behavior challenges in mind when you're thinking about playing certain games. Um, uh, this isn't a game that some that I would ask my separation anxiety clients to play with their dogs. Okay, how do we maintain once all this is trained? How are we going to maintain that focus and attention? Um, we talked early about the dogs acquired the skill. Now you've helped them acquire the skill. You've helped them generalize that skill from inside to outside to different environments. They've they're fluent at it anywhere and everywhere now. Now it's time for the maintenance phase. We want to check that box too. So you're going to need to practice daily. Easy to fit in one or two reps, and it's repetition, repetition, repetition. And why would I have me and a mandolin and my dog beside me as a picture for maintenance? It's because my own story of lack of maintaining a behavior, um, I think, is easy for most people to understand. I learned to play the mandolin um, in my late 40s. So it was a new skill, and I was very conscious. Um, um, I still say conscientious. I said I was conscientious about practicing and playing, but I was nervous playing around other people. Um, I was nervous playing around Brad. I wouldn't even practice and try to learn when he was home. Love him more than anything. We've been married 38 years or that time, what? 25 years. But anyway, um, I didn't want him to hear me play. I was too self-conscious. To, to play in front of him, but I learned to play in the privacy of my own home. And then he wanted to hear me play. And when I started playing in front of him, it, it, it was a big distraction. It was harder for me to play. I had to learn to become fluent in that environment. And then friends wanted to, to join us playing music. Gosh, more people, more sounds of other instruments. That was... Gosh higher distracting oh all of a sudden i had an echo interesting now it's gone there was sorry sorry folks there was an echo for me for a moment i don't know if it was for you as well then i had to learn with all those other people in a room in our home then we had to learn i had to learn to do that on a street corner playing with friends out in public and then had to learn how to do that playing on stage after moving through all those different phases of learning with higher level distractions, I became pretty proficient on the mandolin. I was a pretty good mandolin player. And then life happened and I stopped practicing. I lost the behavior. So if indeed you gain success with your dog and, and you have, have what you consider to be good success for you and you're well pleased with what you've trained, know that you have to keep, continue to maintain that behavior. It has to be reinforced in some way for it to be maintained. That could be food, it could be toys, it could be playing games with your dog. I'm a huge reinforcer for my dog. If um, if I fall down on the ground and, and start doing hands-on praise with Keaton, that's probably better than food for him, quite frankly. So just know that maintenance is important. This is a snippet of a video from Willow from our Tazer Dog Rocket Recall video. So it doesn't specifically show the name game it's it's talking about recall but know that had i not trained focus and attention had i not done the name game and the the checking game i wouldn't have been able to get this level of success with her so now let's take a look at at a video this is example of um, maintaining a rocket recall as well as the recall and release so willow is way in the woods on the other side <clears throat> Of the pasture. Yes. I've called her. She returns to me. I mark the good behavior, boy. reinforce her, send her yes. to go play again. Okay, go play. Now she's looking at Cody, our other dog. I use Willow. my recall cue come and come she come. immediately disengages from Cody and comes to me. I yes. mark the behavior, reinforce it, and send her off to go play again. Thank you. Very nice. Okay, good play. And then this time, she's way out of view. She's over that little Willow. knoll in the pasture. Come, come, come. I call her. That's Cody coming first. See that little speck? She passes by Brad. She passes by Cody, continuing rocketing to me happily, enthusiastically. And I reinforce the heck out of this. What a good girl. Yes. Good. Awesome. Good play. Come on, let's go. 
So now let's take a look. So the name game, the checking game, the name game will lead you to um, success with many other things because we have to have our dog's attention first before we teach them anything. So the, I mentioned this earlier when we started, there always are peaks and valleys in learning, even when you're doing everything right. So here are things to think about to help your training uh, be successful or get you back on track. Um, you learn differently than I learn. Um, we all learn differently as people. That's true with dogs, too. There's always going to be individuality in the learner. And if something doesn't go right in a training session, I look, I consider myself looking in the mirror and saying, okay, I'm responsible for my dog's training. How can I tweak things in the environment or in my training session to help my dog be successful? I said this before, but it bears repeating, please leave judgment behind. Um, that's not good or that's bad. It's just information that you need to change something to help your dog be successful. So put on your problem solving hat and um, you'll be able to climb over those speed bumps. Here are the different things that could crop up. I'm going to go through each one of these um, in a minute. Failure to choose a reinforcer that's high enough in value not understanding how to add distance, duration, distractions. It could be your body movement. There's too much of it. Lack of clarity about what you're training. Frustration during training. It happens even where your the goal is fun training. Negative frame of mind. Training when your dog isn't well. And failure to back up in a training exercise when the current exercise doesn't bring about success. So, we want our dogs to always feel motivated by receiving a paycheck that's equal to the work that they're putting out. Whoop, putting out. So choose the right value of reinforcer. If kibble isn't working, go to something that your dog thinks is more valuable. And you may have to try. Get a smorgasbord of foods out and see which, which uh, foods your dog gravitates toward more. Um, and again, you're going to build that reinforcement hierarchy so you know um, how your dog values different foods. Distance, duration, and distractions. Each one of those things need to be trained separately. So you need to be thoughtful about how you fold in distance, how you add distance when you're uh, training, how you add distractions, and duration. You know, your dog looking at you for one second is one thing, but your dog maintaining eye contact with you for five to 10 seconds, that's a whole nother level of duration. So know that you need to be thoughtful about how you add those in and go from low level to high level relative to distractions, low level distractions to higher level distractions and systematically train those the way i've i've shared the training games with you phase one phase two and phase three should help set you up for success so that you do that appropriately extraneous body movement our dogs are such keen observationists if we're moving in certain ways while we're adding cues or training them they may think our body movement is part of that cue so the cleaner you can be meaning the 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 more still you can be, limit your your body movements. Um, and relative to talking, saying less is is more. Less is more. Lack of clarity about your training. Be clear. If you're fuzzy about what you're training and you don't give thought to it ahead of time, then how do you know where you're going? You don't have a GPS where well, your dog doesn't have a GPS system. They don't automatically know where you're going. So you have to, you have to decide where you're going, then help them get there through training. If you ever feel frustrated during training, it's time to stop. Um, if you're frustrated, your dog will feel that frustration. If you notice your dog's frustration, then figure out what you might need to change. If my dog looks frustrated for some reason, I'm going to try to figure out why. Maybe I've asked too much of them. Maybe I'm not using the right value of reinforcer. Maybe I've trained too long. It could be a number of different things, but frustration is a sign that you need to take a step back, either take a pause from your training or start the next day. 
I want you to be happy during training. I want your dog to be happy during training. You and your dog. Negative frame of mind. We all have bad days um, for whatever reason that might be. If you decide you want to try to train on a day when you're maybe not feeling perfectly, I would suggest maybe setting training aside for a day. I, I know that I don't train well, even if I want it. Training with my dog makes me happy. I mean, that really is a, a coping mechanism for me oftentimes. But sometimes if I'm so bothered by something, um, then it's not going to be as fun for my dog as it would be. So I'm going to take a day off in training. When your dog isn't well, I would hope that none of you would purposely ask your dog to learn when they don't feel well. But oftentimes, our, we don't know. Dogs mask their pain so well. So we may not know. It could be um, that you things just aren't going right for some reason with your dog, not like they did yesterday or the day before. So certainly if your dog isn't well, don't train. But if you suspect um, anything could be medically wrong with them, please visit your vet um, and make sure you have a clean bill of health before you start training. You might be heading down the road thinking you're training really, really well, and then you hit a, a giant speed bump. That just might mean you need to go back to where training was last successful. It's so easy to say, but he should know it. He did it yesterday, but he's not doing it. If he's not doing it now, it's not working for whatever reason. Put on your problem solving hat, figure that out. And if in doubt, turn your car around, go back, start at the exercise where your dog was last successful. Everybody lives with a video camera in their hand these days. Most, most of us have a smartphone, if not all of us, and it's got video capabilities on it. Video is your friend. The more you can video yourself training with your dog, the more you're going to learn about yourself and your dog. It moves you from being that actor on the stage to that person in the audience that has different observation skills. So you can pick up the little nuances that you might be um, doing, the nuances of your behavior that you might be doing that your dog notices that you don't understand are happening at the same time. If you've videoed yourself before, awesome, you're, you're skilled at this already. If you've never vid videoed yourself training and you watch it back, I want you to be kind to yourself. If you're tempted to find all the things you did wrong, take a deep breath and notice all the things you did right. First of all, you trained, you set up your video camera, you're watching it back, and none of us are ever perfect. So know that video is your friend and you're gonna learn a lot from videoing your training sessions. Considerations for training around prey. I'd like to think, I would like to think that my that I am the ultimate distraction for my dog. Um, I'm pretty pretty much a high value reinforcer for him, but he's very distracted, not unlike Kaylee was by bunnies. And most dogs find prey the ultimate distraction. Dogs are predators, and every dog has some level of genetic predisposition to be interested in prey. I don't think there's ever a hundred percent. I can't predict 100% that my dog is only, always going to focus on me around prey. They're predators, and there's always a chance a dog will choose prey over a trained cue. So when you're training, focus and attention out of doors, off leash, please always be in a safe, fenced area. With all my dogs, other than Kaylee, I always felt comfortable after training, let me say, after I had trained them to a certain level, I felt comfortable walking in new unknown places that weren't fenced. That changed with Kaylee. Kaylee's 
genetic predisposition for prey was really, really high, even though she was an Australian shepherd. And even though I had trained her to come a call away from, or to come to me and be called away from deer, I still wasn't sure that if she saw deer when we were off leash outside of our fenced area, that she wouldn't chase them. Sure, it's 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 the road seems like a long way away, but it's not. So I'm never going to risk my dog's life. And for Kaylee, I always had her on a 15 foot or 20 foot long line when I was outside in unknown areas that were not fenced. I don't want to have deadly trust. Um, there's a trainer whose name I can't remember, and I need to do a search on the article. Um, find there's an article on deadly trust. I think that's the, the name of it. But in essence, that says, you, you know, you trust your dog to always respond to your cues. And there are too many instances of when that didn't happen. I want to make sure that I wake up to my dog the next morning. So please always be safe. I talked about Kaylee's lovely love of bunnies. I want before I start training around prey to have success with all of those phases of the check-in game and the name game. And I want to design a management plan around prey. That's gonna be my six foot leash and my long line, but it's also gonna be making the distance I am from that prey, whether it's a squirrel, a bird or a deer. <clears throat> You've heard me say this, time again on many slides, I want to create an environment that my dog can be successful in. That includes folding in the 3Ds appropriately, how, how far I am away from that prey. Is the prey moving? Is Are the deer in the pasture moving? Is the bunny running? I, and be mindful of how long you asked your dog to focus on you or even work with you in the presence of prey. It can be highly arousing for them. And it could be that highly arousing could be if they get too aroused and there's not an optimum learning environment for them. You need to understand your dog's predatory motor sequence. So dogs have this sequence. They orient, they toward the prey, they usually smell it first, they eye it, they see it, they begin the stalk, they chase, they grab bite, they kill with a bite, and then they can they dissect it and then they consume. Even though Kaylee was an Australian shepherd dog and a working dog, bred for herding, she had this full predatory motor sequence. Unfortunately, I watched her move through all of these and yes, she did consume it. Most, most dogs through hundreds of hundreds of years of breeding, selective breeding, don't have the at least the last three uh, steps in the predatory motor sequence. All dogs have some portion of these and every breed is different. Every individual dog within a breed is different, but understand your own dog's um, sequence. The sooner you can or, uh, interrupt your dog, in this sequence, the more chances you're going to have of success with whatever exercise you're training around prey. Here's the biggest challenge training around prey. It's hard to control the prey. I can't text the deer and say, could you show up in the pasture today or the bunnies so I can do some training with my dog. You have to find ways to safely train with your dog around prey. I fortunately have the ability to do that in my own pasture because deer jump the fence and I can can oftentimes set um, training up, but it's happenstance. It's like, oh, the deer are out there. Let me go see if I can do some training. So deer and bunnies, um, yeah, those were Kaylee's biggest. And deer, not so much with Keaton, but he's pretty interested in the bunnies too. Squirrels, yes, but deer and, and bunnies are more. So here's what I do. Um, what I'm doing, I guess I should say, I never fully trained this with Kaylee. Unfortunately, she passed away before we got too far along with using scent. But I was using rabbit scent. So take advantage if you want to start working around the scent of prey, use just the scent, not the sight. I can control the scent. 
Um, I planned to have just a little bit of that scent in the environment when I was starting to work on the training games with her. And then I purchased rabbit pelt to use during training. I could put the scent on the pelt, it, so not just the scent, but the sight and the scent. Scent is a big distraction, so you have to be stringent with your management plan and have your dog on leash. I had her on leash even though I was inside the house and the scent was in the room. I didn't want her moving toward that scent to, um, to get to it or to that pelt. And I trained the foundation games and I trained the recall games um, with her as well. So after we had done some of that training, um, we never got a chance to do this with bunnies and I can't control the bunnies, but I would have had um, a motorized, there are motorized animals that you can buy. I was planning to move to a motorized animal, but here is the result of Kaylee. Um, after we moved to the foundation games, when deer were in the pasture, you can see the fence here. All the the um, the land outside that fence is also fenced, so the deer will jump into that far pasture, and they will graze under the trees and in the pasture there. And we can be um, here in this barnyard area when I can have when I had her on leash, both six foot and long line training before we got to the point where I could recall her away from deer. Kaylee is somewhere up in the pasture. I'm going to call her. Oh, I see her running across the top of the pasture. There are big deer up there. Hold your ears. I'm going to call. Kaylee! Come, come, come! Yes! What a good girl! Top of the pasture, middle screen. Little dot. Yay! What a good girl. Awesome, baby girl. That was fabulous. That was awesome. Thank you. I'm going to move right into making training part of your everyday life. Everybody has busy lives. How are you going to do it? Um, active training, you're setting time aside to work on a specific training exercises. Less is more. You want to be consistent with it. Always end with success. Passive training is catching your dog, getting it right. If you're moving around the house during the day and your dog just happens to check, check in with you, reinforce that. Um, the more you reinforce what you like, the more you'll get that behavior from your dog. You can implement crafty training. I have two mugs on my desk and I have all the exercises that I want to work on with my dog in one mug on, and written on craft sticks. And so when I have a lunch break or I'm making the coffee, I can pick up one of those craft sticks, say, okay, I'm gonna play the name game today, do two, rep, two or three repetitions of it. And then I put that craft stick in the empty mug and then off I go. Um, work, do whatever, come back when I have a break, pick another craft stick and then move it from um, one mug to the other. We do have a blog post on our website. Um, so there's the link and you'll, I'm providing Deborah with PDFs of this presentation. So you'll have that link. Here are ways you can fit in training um, these games in, into your life with your dog. When you're taking your normal walk around the neighborhood or a public place, when you're walking with your dog on a long line in open spaces that aren't fenced, anytime your dog's off leash in a safely fenced area, say their name, mark it and reinforce it when they look at you. If they offer a check-in, mark and reinforce it. Then when they're mildly distracted by something in the environment, that's a good chance um, to work on the exercises. If you're successful, yay, great. If you're not, don't do that again. Move to a lesser distracting environment. When your dog is playing with another dog, if they disengage and happen to look at you, mark and reinforce that. Same thing with a person. You know, once they disengage from a person and happen to give you attention, mark and reinforce that. 
you're going to get a, um, a free copy on, of the 12 Rules of Rocket Recall, but even though I say that the 12 Rules of Rocket Recall, there are a few that are really salient for attention and focus, and that's train it and practice it. I'm not going to go through each one of these because you're going to um, have a copy of these. Reinforce all check-ins during other times of the day. When your dog trots over to say hi, boy, praise him and reinforce him for that with a piece of yummy food. Be happy about it. Tell them they're the best dog in the whole wide world. If you're reinforcing check-ins, that will help your dog stay closer to you and check in more frequently. Don't ever use your dog's name um, to then do something that they don't like. So don't use their name and call them to you to cut their nails or give them a bath. Never repeat your cue. Say their name once. If they don't look at you immediately, say a kissy noise or make another noise to cause them to get attention, uh, get, to give you attention. And then I said this earlier, maintain it after you train it. Make sure that they move through all those different phases of learning. And then you make a lifelong commitment to practice periodically at least three times a week so your dog's behavior stays strong. Play hide and seek. I don't know if, if I have, I think I have more fun than Keaton does. So my offering to you are the a free download of the 12 rules of rocket recall. There's your link. Deborah will also send that to you. And my book is available from, is available from Amazon, Dogwise and Mungo Books in Canada. Check with your local uh, re book reseller, please, as well. Have uh, the training behavior and concepts that I talked about today and a lot more in the first part of the book. Then we uh, goes into the focus and, focus and attention games and then the recall training games. I have a list of recommended reading and viewing for you. So you'll have that in the PDF, some books that I suggest and videos on demand that uh, Brad and I have done that you might enjoy. And it's a wrap. So I'm right. I really went over. I was going to stop for questions. For those of you who can stay, we're going to stay longer and answer questions. So thank you, your dog's friend. Thank you, all of you, for being here with me on a Saturday afternoon, no matter where you are. And for those of you who are going to be watching this afterwards, thanks for watching the recording afterwards. And I'm going to stop sharing now so I can see some people if you turn your videos on. Thanks, everybody. Okay, um, there. I'm. Thank you for staying for a, a little while extra. Uh, there's oh, some. My great goodness, questions. of course. Um, one is how do I get my dog to relax outside and lower his stimulation? I would say, you know, I don't, I don't know your dog, and I don't know what your outside is like. So let me tell you um, what I shared. You saw Bebop. Um, and Angela in that video, when she started to take Bebop outside to work on the, the training, the training game outside, the checking game, Bebop was so scared. Um, now he wasn't aroused, but he was scared of the outdoor environment. There was traffic and other sounds he hadn't heard. If you can video record record the sound of those things that might be arousing towards your dog to your dog if you can't limit the his sight of those distractions then you might be able to record sounds and play those inside while you're training with him so i you know i would say i don't know what what your dog's distractions are but whatever they are try to limit those get rid of those or move to an environment where your dog can focus on you Okay, and here's a question I love. Um, can training begin as soon as you rescue a dog from months and months in the shelter? Do they need a period of time to adjust to the family environment? That is first? a that is a wonderful question. And I like to have a dog in a home at least every dog is different, right? I mean, I think we in general, it's 60 to 90 days for a dog to adjust to a new home environment. I want to wait at least a couple of weeks. Those first, when that dog first comes home, you just want to focus on building a bond with your dog, making good things happen in the presence of you and your home. So I would be 
if if the dog is not fearful, I mean, you can reinforce the fact that they're looking at you, but I'm not going to put any stringent training requirements on a brand new dog who's come from a shelter or 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 any environment that may have been different than my home. Good question. Okay. Um, someone wants to know what to do when she goes down to the level of her puppy on the floor and the puppy is acting like a baby shark. <laughs> oh, you first of all, know that you have a normal puppy. I have a blog on my uh, 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 article on our blog called Shark Week. Um, yes. So, so don't sit on the floor. You might sit up on the sofa. You might need to work with a barrier between you and your puppy. So it might be a low X pin or a play pin, um, a pet gate. But for me, and then have something that your puppy can have their mouth on as well. Uh, but for me with my puppy, like Keaton, you saw me on the floor with him. There were times with Kaylee that I needed to be sitting on a sofa. And so if you're working with your dog and keeping them busy and not too much time in between repetitions of your exercise, your, your puppy should be able to focus on you and your feet and your arms uh, might be safe. Okay, the next question. Is it preferable to use a specific word rather than the dog's name for the recall cue? I use the dog's name often when not training and wonder if that confuses him. I want, I like to use uh, my, you heard me say in the presentation, and this is, this is true for me, it's also true for Brad. My dog's name in our world, my dog's name means look at me and wait for further instruction. It doesn't mean anything else. Um, I don't want my dog's name to be my recall cue because if I want to recall my dog to me or get my dog's attention, I guess I should say, I don't want, I want to be able to say Keaton wait or Keaton down. I don't want Keaton to mean run to me because there could be a hazard between me and my dog. Um, could be a downed power line. It could be a snake. It could. So I want a different recall cue than my dog's name. My dog's name is a cue to look at me and then wait for the next bit of instruction that I'm going to give him. Okay. Um, this is about the first step in the name game. Uh huh. Are you just saying the name and treating continuously whether they look at you or not in order yes. to get the so, name for their name? So, so yes. So if you ever, then that's classical conditioning. We're creating an emotional response with the dog. I'm saying their name and I'm pairing the sound of that word, their name with something of high value. So I don't want them to be on the other side of the room with doing this. You want to be with your dog close, but just say the name, give a piece of food, say the name, give a piece of food. If you've ever charged a clicker or turned on a clicker, you know how we pair the sound of the clicker with food. That's really what we're doing with the name. We're pairing the dog's name, that sound with food. So it takes on a positive emotional response in the dog. Then you can start training. Um, the, the name game, asking for the name and getting a response. A few people have the same question, and this comes up a lot too. Do you ever wean off the treats? If so, when? Um, when when do you stop feeding your dog food? I mean, reinforcers, is for that training. what you said? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, here's my analogy. Um, when when you go to work every day um, and you do you got really good at your job maybe you were new at your job and you got really good at your job did your employer stop paying you i bet they didn't so your dog needs to earn some sort of reinforcement for the training at hand for the behavior they give you now it may not be food but it may be praise if that praise has been paired with food. So you saw in my instructions, I want you to also praise your dog while, while you're reinforcing them. 
if your dog is being reinforced, that's a consequence for that behavior, but you're also praising them while food is happening, that, that praise is being paired with food and takes on more value. So certainly praise can work further down the road, but when your dog is in the acquisition phase of learning, they need a primary reinforcer. They need something high value to them that's motivating to them and it's going to be food. So I'm still, even though Keaton has some trained behaviors that are really, really consistent and he's really reliable, I am still gonna be periodically reinforcing him with food in order to help uh, those behaviors be strong. Food is always part of my the equation, though it may not happen every single time. I might play tug with him. I might roll on the, as I said, flop on the ground and play with him as, as a reinforcer. But he is getting reinforced in some way, shape, or form. I'm not just ignoring the fact that um, he looked at me or came to me. Um for a dog who has been trained by someone else before ours is a retired greyhound racer how do you adapt to prior unknown training you know we don't know what we don't know you know we don't know what that dog has been through um i i just you know you and you have to meet your dog where where he is um your current dog will never be like your last dog and your next dog will never be like the dog you have right now so you start and presume that they have no knowledge and train them the way you would like to train them benevolently with trust building a bond with them making sure they feel safe and comfortable with you and you're always advocating for them you know i'm a big advocate for dogs they can't our dogs can't speak for themselves so we have to speak for them and we want them always to feel emotionally safe and physically safe when we're with them and when we're training them. All right. Um, when you let your dog out in a small backyard, uh, she said her, her dog barks like crazy at squirrels, often does not listen to us. She lifts him up does not want to encourage this behavior, how does she train it the best way? So, yeah, it's, you know, that's the hard thing. It's hard to control the squirrels, right? So you may, do, you may need to sit inside your house where your dog can see squirrels out the window and start working with your dog inside with just the sight of squirrels um, and gain success there before you then sit on your back porch with your dog on leash. Um, and train there before you ever are out in the yard where squirrels might be. With that said, we have squirrels in our yard. I let Keaton out. He will go chase a squirrel, and but comes right back. But yet he's not barking at them. Remember, if we're going to train a behavior, we have to prevent the unwanted behavior from being reinforced while we're training a new behavior. So around squirrels, I would have my dog on leash. I would not let him run, chase them and bark at them. I would start working inside um, with squirrels in sight and then slowly but surely move outside around the house before you're on leash in your yard working around squirrels. Harry answered this question on chat, but you may want to answer it for the sake of, of people who see the video. When you were talking about harnesses and collars, uh -huh. someone wanted to know whether a martingale collar avoided that trachea issue. So martingales are limited slip collars, so they tighten only so much. They do have the ability to still um, um, tighten up I don't know, I'd, and dogs can still pull on a martingale uh, collar. Many dogs um, with, with um, heads and necks that are the same size, such as greyhounds, um, people will put martingale collars on those dogs and collars are fine. I just don't like to have a collar um, when I, 
on a dog and only use that in case the dog might pull quickly. I don't want the, the collar to uh, hurt their trachea or their esophagus. So many people use martingale collars. I also like to have a harness on my dog. It's my own way of, of just making sure that I have um, a tool that won't put any pressure on their neck. That looks, I, whenever I say this, questions pour in, but that looks like all the questions, plus we're over time. I want to thank you so much. This was such a clear explanation. Oh, well, good. Uh, I'm so happy. Thank you all for being with me. And thank you for, for staying with me for questions, everyone. Thank you all so much for taking the time to, to out of your Saturday to be with me, to gain information, to help your dogs. Yay. Big round of applause for your dog's friend. Thank you for thank doing you. what you do. Okay, yes. and thanks and for joining you're us. You're welcome. Please join us on Facebook. We post things there. Know that our YouTube channel, there's lots of videos there. Um, and we'd love to hear your success stories. Share them on the Cold Nose College page. I love nothing more than hearing about success. Great. Thanks. Thank everyone. you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.